Okay, hello everybody. Uh, so I'm Carol Willis and I welcome you to the second week of rewriting skyscraper history for other related lectures that really lay the basis for this continuing discussion that Tom and Don are going to be having today and also tomorrow. And this is a little bit of an evolving format. It's the closest to what um, often now is being described as the flipped lecture format, especially for universities where the professor tapes the talk and then the class session is just a discussion after the students have prepared in listening to that, um, that previously recorded uh, lecture. And so that's what we're gonna try for the first time tonight. Uh, after I give a short introduction of an overview of the topic and a little bit about the premises of the lecture series, uh, uh, we will be sharing the screen with Tom Leslie, who is a professor at Iowa State University in the School of Design and School of Architecture um, and, and Design, uh, who gave a talk, a wonderful talk, on Chicago's other skyscrapers last week in the series that you can also now see on our website. Uh, on Chicago's grain elevators. And um, doing today, uh, which is uh, a kind of follow up on Don's wonderful talk on New York skyscrapers from about 1870s uh, through the 1890s and indeed 1900. And as part of this introduction, I will um, show you the cover of his new book, Structure of Skyscrapers, so, uh, and, and give you a little bit of the background of how we uh, came to uh, some of the research uh, to benefit from some of Don's research uh, that was developed for that book. Now, I'm gonna share my screen now, and um, this is the overview, the overall title of the series, Rewriting Skyscraper History, and then, you know, colon, looking back from the 21st century. And so I do wanna talk briefly about that. now. Don Friedman is a structural engineer. Tom Leslie is an architect. They're both historians and eminent historians of their specialty as, as well as mo more broadly. Um, but I'm going to talk as an art historian tonight um, and give a little bit of um, kind of standard narratives the way art historians, architectural historians are wont to do um, with, uh, with overview. Uh, so this is the page on our website that I alluded to, where at the bottom of this screen, you would find the two videos. Uh, you see the overview title, Masonry to Steel, which is the subject of, the, of, of this week too, the decades of the 1870s to the 1890s. And then ha this idea of how masonry construction or masonry systems transitioned to metal, um, because it wasn't just steel, and then to steel. Uh, and in, in particular, uh, Tom is going to be talking tomorrow about material matters, brick, uh, iron, and steel. And Don will cover much of that same material um, from the New York perspective as Tom takes the, takes the Chicago um, perspective or the Chicago school as the subject. Uh, and here you also see on our website the other videos and uh, you will also find underneath the, uh, the, the older videos on our website, you'll find underneath the new videos on our website some, some related readings that we suggest. Now, this series is really has its genesis from a symposium last year, and I mentioned this in an early, earlier week's introduction, of a, um, a, a one-day symposium event appended to the conference of the Council on Tall Buildings and Urban Habitat that marked their 50th anniversary. It was held in Chicago, their home, uh, back last October. In fact, it was on Halloween day. It was a snowy Halloween day. Uh, and we um, gathered together a, a group of papers that had been somewhat um, overseen or selected by a steering committee. And on that steering committee are some of the people that you see in this kind of joke uh, video. Uh, this was um, trying to slay uh, with, a, with a souvenir of the John Hancock building, like, a, like a, a silver stake, trying to slay the zombie of the home insurance building uh, and to myth, myth bust about that idea. I won't go on too long and hard about that particular point. But the idea of a first skyscraper was um, unanimous, unanimously rejected by all of us, some of, some of whom you see in this picture, uh, with Don Friedman over on the far side and Tom, Tom Leslie looking at us. 
uh, it was it was roundly rejected by all the steering committee who when were they were asked us to talk about the first skyscraper said uh, no uh, no we don't believe that uh, and we didn't believe in firsts either but what happened was the title got an s appended to first skyscraper and then it also got its uh, inverse uh, skyscraper first and much of that conference was about new technologies and tonight's lecture is also about new technologies um, but it also <clears throat> quite, uh, frames the narrative of Chicago versus New York that we have discussed and when I say we I mean Don and Tom have already discussed in previous lectures um, at the museum um, hang on <clears throat> And they, uh, those uh, two schools are represented by the images that you see here, the Tribune Building, 1875, on the Home Insurance Building. Um, that shows you in this image that the Tribune Building was uh, about 100 feet taller than the Home Insurance Building, and it was 10 years earlier in the history. Um, so, but it had not going for it the, that it was a pure masonry structure. Uh, so part of uh, the debate about New York and, and Chicago is, has been, uh, again, told by Don and Tom, but is, is part of the, the, the standard story. And that is that New York uh, has, is uh, held back by its building code and, and Chicago uh, moves ahead, pioneering the sky with this new superior technology of the steel frame. And you see in those images, the Chicago frame on the uh, on one side against the tower building in New York, um, uh, like 21 feet wide and 11 stories tall, um, illustrating the value of the land in Manhattan that was driving uh, buildings ever ever, <clears throat> ever taller. But you also see in this image on the stretch back toward from Broadway to New Street, where you can see the shadow of the, the metal cage construction and then the brick infill uh, of fireproofing that Don is going to talk a little bit about in, in his talk tonight, but uh, it covers much more completely in the earlier talks already on our website. So the museum has in previous exhibitions uh, confronted or tackled the history of height. And this is one of the panels well, there's several panels um, that are remounted in our permanent galleries that look at uh, tall buildings and the impulse to build high from the pyramids to the present. And what you're seeing in this framing is the pyramids, if you look along the bottom, uh, to Park Row, so 1900, tallest, the tallest building in 1900. That is tallest building, occupied building, because by far the tallest structure at this point in history was the Eiffel Tower. So. The history of height that you're seeing um, in its complexity of aspirations of new technologies, of code restrictions, of all, all kinds of factors that contribute or constrain height, um, you can see a little bit in, uh, and again, this is on our website, so you can look at the history of height and explore that and read the, um, the little uh, flashcards, as I, as I call them, that you saw in some of the previous slides. This uh, 18, 83 image uh, that uh, that compiles the masonry structures of of, uh, of, of history with uh, the idea of tallest seeing it um, almost at the top of the pyramid the actual pyramids the um, the Giza Egyptian pyramid and then sticking up just above that the point of the obelisk of the Washington Monument, which in 1883, oh, and my cursor, I still not able to, there it goes, it's just really slow. Um, which in 1883, as you can see in these two images, was just topping out as the world's tallest structure uh, at 555 feet. But of course, uh, another uh, four years later or so, we have the Eiffel Tower at 300 meters, um, almost a thousand feet, uh, heralding the century of steel, at least the century of metal, the triumph of metal, uh, metal enabling height. So that was the narrative that controlled the 20th century, which is the century of steel. And here we have the um, ascending um, massive base of the Sears Tower, 
um, just under construction. And what we see, and um, here I um, quote the, the very neat summary of uh, Bill Baker, uh, the structural engineer from SOM, uh, who has built many a structure. In the next one, you'll see Burj Khalifa, the world's uh, tallest building now, and who says of the skyscrapers, like the ones he builds, if you if skyscraper history had stopped in 1975, you would say that a skyscraper is a steel built, an, an office building constructed of steel in North America. Um, but if you want to look from the 21st century backwards, uh, and here is the rising uh, concrete uh, structure of the Burj Khalifa in Dubai, uh, you would say that the um, that that a a great skyscraper is uh, somewhere other than in North America, in the Middle East or in China, is uh, perhaps a mixed-use building. Building Burj Khalifa is, is a mostly residential. So here we have the reassertion of masonry in the history of the skyscraper, which is remains rather unconsidered uh, in uh, the definitions of the skyscraper that appear everywhere on the internet. A, uh, a, a very tall building with st of steel skeleton construction. So uh, here is the rising frame of the Jeddah Tower, which will, if it's ever finished, um, question mark, uh, will be a thousand meters tall uh, and uh, an ex extraordinary expression of structural expertise, but is a building that described as I heard in a lecture uh, by its stru structural engineer from Thornton Tomasetti, Robert Sin, um, is a pure bearing wall structure. And you see it here going up. Um, and I know Bill Baker has said in lectures about the Burj Khalifa, if I had it to do over again, that buttress core system um, that what that they um, invented, well, invented or you know perfected for that, for that, that in that particular structure, that if he had it to do over again, he would get rid of the columns. So a column, literally column-free building, and here it is, a pure bearing wall. So. Um, as now I'm able to show you the cover of, of Don Friedman's wonderful book, The Structure of Skyscrapers in America, 1871 to 1900, um, and it's soon to be released. You can see on the cover of that book, the 1900 building, the Flatiron Building um, going up uh, with still ascending its uh, steel frame uh, and covered in a terracotta uh, curtain wall. So that's that story of steel uh, and um, this particular book. And I, I wanted to kind of segue, well, I did want to segue before, but now I'm doing it in the middle. <laughs> uh, uh, to look at the kind of data that Don put together. In fact, here at the Skyscraper Museum, as we were doing our 10 and taller show, we always call this Don's data. Uh, you see two pages here. Um, we conveniently juxtapose the Western Union building and the tower building. Um, but the, the, this slide that shows a page of Don's Excel sheet uh, for all of the several hundred buildings that are, that are documented um, in his his study uh, of which the conclusions he, he will impart tonight um, from at least part of them from, from structure of skyscrapers, that Excel sheet was, was in part his way of, of managing the material. And of course, we said to Don at the time, well, we hate Excel sheets at the Skyscraper Museum. Um, what we like is maps. And um, he said, well, I already spent 10 years on this one. So if you want to make a map, go ahead. And, and so that is what we did. And in this project, Ten and Taller, which became the, an exhibition at the museum, but this remains on our website as an interactive uh, web project, um, you can manipulate the controls and add the footprints by the slider of each building um, that Don documented through the, uh, all, all of the, the building data um, accumulated through engineering journals and also trips to the uh, Department of Buildings in, in, in multiple uh, cities and certainly many a year here in New York City. Uh, so you can, you can see the footprints added as these buildings spread across Manhattan. And there are many things that you will observe and I may allude to in, tonight in some of my questions. Um, but in addition to the map, we took the same data and turned it into this kind of graph-like chart. And what you can see here 
is every year the addition of buildings in New York City uh, that are represented according to their height by on the on the background ruler, uh, their their height in feet. Uh, by the year that they're constructed, uh, and then also by color coding for their use. So red is office buildings, light blue is apartment buildings, dark blue are hotels, uh, and orange, which you get at the end of the, of the 19, of 1890s, uh, loft buildings. And you can see here in a graph of New York, an extremely similar graph to what you can also see in, in Tom's talk, uh, tomorrow or at, at your convenience where he um, takes, uh, he uh, derived from, from Frank Randall, a chart of construction in Chicago over these same years. So one of the questions that emerges from uh, Don's um, spectacular, absolutely complete data set of every building in New York that was 10 stories or taller from the, from the first skyscrapers in 1874 to 1900, when again, they become too, too ubiquitous to, to, uh, to even chart. Um, what you can see here is in those early years from the Tribune building and the, and the uh, Western Union building, the sparsity of tall buildings, their exceptional um, character in 1874 and 75, um, and also the mix of uses of residential buildings that are as frequent as office buildings in the tall building genre. Um, and then there is this an enormous explosion. There are reasons that, we're, that Tom and Don and I will discuss about why we surmise that there was less construction um, after in the in the mid 1870s and that panic of 1873 would certainly have a lot to do, that was a lasting recession, would certainly have to, a lot to do with the um, low demand for office buildings, at least tall office buildings at this moment. But we remember in both New York and Chicago, the cities were expanding in their population in the showed us last the cities were growing enormously but they weren't they were growing horizontally but they weren't necessarily growing vertically uh, until the later 1880s and then into the 1890s so this is one of the questions we can pose as we continue in this um, seminar format um, and um, I have um, put the cover of uh, Tom's book here so I don't neglect to do that and to, um, to mention him and preface him uh, with that and then um, a, a final image that shows you again, based on Don's data and collecting a picture of every one of the buildings, at least one picture of every one of the buildings that um, he tracked down. You can see how quickly we move um, over the years with very few buildings until then, um, if you were to scroll further through the 1890s, there will be many, many buildings to represent. So I just wanted to show those in that square um, and allude to uh, what you can explore on your own um, in much more detail on, on our website and, and hopefully invite you to do that and see what conclusions you might draw. So we will um, continue now with the discussion and I'm going to bring Don into the physical space here. And actually, um, I will probably move out of that um, as he, he in a moment comes on camera. But let me just um, mention now with this um, webinar format and the, and the Q and A that we can engage in now, uh, that it's delightful probably in the first time uh, of the Skyscraper Museum's long programming history that we can say we actually have enough time for the discussion. We're always running out of time for discussion, but now we have the talks before. We hope that this format will work for you and that you will come as good students prepared um, to each one of the discussions, but this we hope is going to be our format mo moving forward. The flipped lecture where you watch the lecture in advance and then um, the speakers can uh, speak in dialogue with uh, either their paired speaker or other speakers in the in the course of the series. So this is a new format. I hope it's, it's going to be enjoyable for you. Just to recap my talk for people who did not have the opportunity to see it, uh, actually worse. What I wanted to do when I started doing my research was to approach the question of early skyscrapers as a question in the history of technology rather than the history of architecture. Uh, so what I was doing was looking solely at the structural systems of various, as, as many as I could find, uh, old tall buildings. Um, 
starting with 1880 when everyone is building brick masonry bearing walls uh, and ending in 1900 when almost everybody is building uh, steel skeleton frames and there are transitional forms in between those two extremes. The thing is, what, in retrospect, the difference between them is obvious. Um, when you actually look at the buildings close up, the, the differences in structure are relatively subtle. Uh, and there is no sharp dividing line. That's one of the reasons I personally voted against there being such a thing as a first skyscraper. You get this gradual evolution over the space of 20 years um, of structure with people putting cast iron columns next to masonry piers or embedding them in the masonry piers really as a method of reinforcing the brick. Um, and that gradually turns into a complete frame and then the cast iron gets replaced by wrought iron or steel and you get a, a frame that can that can carry wind load by itself, which in, in the earlier buildings, the brick is doing all the work. And I think that that general progression is reasonably well known. Um, one of the parts of looking at this as the history of technology is that the, the brick walls were not designed per se. They, they were simply code said the wall had to be so thick. Maybe you made it a little bit thicker so you could put your ornament on it, but that was about it. Uh, and that's true well into the 20th century that brick walls were not designed. Um, whereas the metal structure from the very beginning was designed to some degree. And once you get the full skeleton frame that, that is working to, to carry wind load, it has to be really designed. It's, it's modern engineering, modern for the era. Uh, and that's why the engineers came from outside of the building field. They came from bridge engineering for the most part. Um, so that, that, that's sort of the, the engineering version of that story. And what, what accompanies it is a big change in the way that, thing, that, that things are priced. Um, you replace, in, in this process, you replace a very large amount of brick with a much smaller amount of steel. And while the steel is more expensive than the brick is, the, the difference in tonnage, the difference in just gross amount of material is so big that you save a lot of money. Uh, so wh why do people change technology? Why, why, did, why did everybody change to cell phones, from landline phones? Well, part of it is, uh, convenience, but also cost matters. And cell phones became a lot more popular once people didn't have to pay for every single call. Steel framing became much more popular when the cost of the construction came down to a point that it made sense. So it's not just whether the thing works or not, it's whether the builder and the, the, the owner of the project can afford it and thinks it's a good idea because they think it will save them money. So that's, that's a recap of, of my talk. Tom, shoot away. <laughs> yeah, well, I, thanks, Don, and um, appreciated seeing uh, the the talk pull together a lot of the things that we've talked about uh, over the years into into one coherent presentation. Uh, to me, the 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 really interesting data that you is about cost. And we've talked before about the fact that it means suddenly or to talk about tomorrow night, it's that kind of magic uh, uh, sweet spot that steel hit on saying balance performance versus ease of fabrication that makes it such a, a, a valuable material, right? Not only does it take up less space, not only do you need less of it, uh, but it has fabricational qualities that, that allow it to, to take wind bracing uh, a little more easily. I, one of the things, to, to go back maybe to Carol's framing of this and to, to throw this at you and see see what you think about this. Um, you know, I, things that evolves, right? The, all of a sudden in the 1890s, architects and engineers sort of look backwards and say, wait a minute, there's this thing called the skyscraper all of a sudden, like, where did that, where did that start? Um, evolutionary biologists, Stephen Jay Gould in particular, talk about this idea of punctuated equilibrium, where things go on for periods of tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of years, nothing really happens. And all of a sudden, either an external event or some particularly savory mutation happens in the species, and boom, suddenly like everyone's doing it, right? The, the, the species evolves very, very rapidly. And I got the sense this is a case, right? You're, uh, things progress very, very slowly. We build masonry structures that are better and better and better, uh, taller and taller, you know, not necessarily lighter and lighter. 
Uh, and then all of a sudden we get this external event that happens. Things happen very rapidly, not all of a sudden, but rapidly enough. And it's in the kind of turning back around and saying, wait a minute, we have all these steel frames that there's this very sort of human urge to say, oh, well, you know, what was, what was the first one? Uh, and so I wonder whether that jibes with the, the cost data in particular that you're finding. In other words, uh, do you see one or two uh, examples that seem to take advantage of this right away? Uh, and, and or is it something that once everyone uh, recognizes the, the value of steel, that it, that it sort of takes off like wildfire? The thing to keep in mind is it's funny. It, it, it's slow, as you say, they're punctuated equilibrium. But at certain points, things were moving very quickly. Uh, and because it takes in that era maybe a couple of years to build a big building, I mean, but it's from when you from when you file the plans until you have tenants, easily two years. Some of these buildings, it's three or four. Um, so it takes a while for people to actually understand what's happening. One way of looking at it is that the uh, the, the let's look let's look at a, a timeline from the 1880s. 1884, you have the Produce Exchange in New York, which almost but not quite gets rid of all of the load from the masonry wall. There's a little bit of load in the masonry wall, but if you look at it as a percentage of the building's total weight, it's, it's like two or three percent. It's almost nothing. That's 1884. 1885, the Home Insurance Building in Chicago gets that to zero. All of the interior floor load is carried on metal, not on brick. 1889, you have the Tower Building which is a very peculiar hybrid, but it does manage to have several floors of metal framing carrying, well, it's like six floors of metal framing carrying all of the load, including wind, that there's wind bracing in it. Um, now, six floors out of a 12-story building isn't so great, um, but it's, it's an improvement. 1890, you get the first two skeleton frame buildings. So that's in the space of six years, in an era where it takes two years to build a building, you move from brick carrying load to brick carrying no load in a series of four steps. That's really fast. And I think people didn't have time to digest it and didn't necessarily know anything uh, that other people were doing. I mean, these buildings were not written up before they were constructed. They were written up after. So, um, you know, if you're, if you're William LeBaron Jenny in, in 1885 designing the home insurance building, you don't know what the structure of the produce building is exactly. You may have you've heard about the building, but you don't really know the structure. Um, similarly, uh, the the plans for the first two skeleton frame buildings, the Manhattan Building in Chicago, and I do love that name, by the way, uh, and the London and Lancaster <laughs> Building in New York, those are the first two skeleton frame buildings built almost simultaneously. Those buildings were being planned before the tower building was occupied. So I don't know that they could really have incorporated the thought of, what, of what's going on at the tower building. What happens is that after 1890, the new technology is being written up because it is this fascinating thing. We've eliminated the structural purpose of the masonry walls and that interests people. Um, and that's when it starts going national and that's when it starts getting a lot of attention. And then people start making rational decisions about, should I use this because it will save me money? Up until that point, it's all experimental. Yes, people were trying to save money, but I don't think they, they, they had a basis for making a rational calculation. That's why when I, when I was doing my, trying to do my apples to apples comparison on cost, I chose 1895 because at that point you had simultaneously bearing wall buildings being built, uh, transitional buildings being built, and skeleton frame buildings being built. All three of them were still being constructed in 1895. And therefore, and that you could, if you were, if you put yourself in the mindset of somebody at that time, you can do that comparison. Um, I, I think if you're five years earlier, you can't because because the people at that time did not have the data. And if you're five years later, um, so I, things have proven out so well that there's no reason to do it. One <laughs> comment, Tom, and then I'm going to shut up and let you talk a little bit, uh, which is that from an urbanistic point of view, um, skyscrapers weren't necessary because if you look at the big cities of Europe and certainly you know London at that time is uh, slightly bigger than New York and much bigger than Chicago had almost no tall buildings by our standards so there are reasons why people built them 
but it was never it was never really necessary right it was something that made economic sense and that was one of the big one of the big drivers um i'm gonna shut up like i promised <laughs> well and and i think one of the things that Don, you and I sort of bounced around in in preparation for this week was, you know, the idea that you know why why would you do skyscrapers anyway? And and of course, I I think the the difference that comes to mind immediately between the United States and Europe is that we have this kind of speculative economy in the 1880s 1890s where. Um, you know, the the way to, there are, there are ways to get rich that don't involve being born into it. Uh, and a lot of times that means kind of almost buccaneering, right? Like taking your, uh, whatever leverage you have and trying to find any way to, to beat everyone else at their own game. Um, you know, Cass Gilbert's formulation of the skyscraper, right? It's a machine for making the land pay. Well, that's only half of it, right? It's 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 a way to uh, make an investment pay off too, but that's restricted to a, a a fairly small number of 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 organizations. And the the two things that I think really struck me about your talk and this question that Carol posed to both of us, right? Why weren't there more skyscrapers than there were uh, in this period? Um, I'm curious, you know, knowing the the kind of Chicago situation. It occurred to me that there are only maybe a dozen or so entities that have the wherewithal to front the money necessary to, to put up a big building like that. Um, you know, this being a, a frontier town back in the, the 1880s. And so even though the, the opportunity is there, um, there aren't that many organizations that can actually do it, number one. And number two, there's a bottleneck that, as you alluded to, has to do with expertise. If you have the money, who do you go to, and how long is the line uh, to get William LeBaron Jenny or Daniel Burnham or you know one of these very very limited numbers of um, designers or engineers to 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 do it? And so I'm curious whether that I mean New York at the time is a is a much vaster metropolis than Chicago, but I'm wondering if if you see the same thing that there's a, a fairly limited pool both of investors. And also, you know, limited uh, expertise that that can be applied to turning those investors' money into floor area, essentially. Can I answer? I um, I, I think that those are two separate things yeah. in New York. Uh, and uh, the just to underscore the point that the takeaway for me about Don's talk, but especially about Don's book, because I asked him to talk about this this point uh, to, to frame um, or conclude with the point that modern structure is industrialized structure, right? That, that's, that's what he's talking about, that um, taking, as Tom, you do, taking the brick, brick layers out of um, the process takes away the political problem, the labor cost, and, you know, innumerable complications as well as time, the point that Don makes, um, takes so long to build a building of brick, uh, so if you can build something fast, that becomes part, the, the speed is part of the industrialized process of construction, and everything moves towards that, whether um, it's steel, you know, you know, fabricating steel for, for fast direction, fast delivery, fast, fast direction, whether ultimately it's the curtain wall um, and, uh, and integrated glass units plugging into a, a facade. Everything moves towards trying to minimize labor. Uh, and Joanna Merwood Salisbury is going to talk about labor and capital in another one of, uh, one of our topics. So this is you know, something that we will come back around to if, if from another perspective. But the, the, the process of industrialization uh, is, uh, is, is a big rubric that, um, and you know, Tom, you and I mentioned before in, in, in an email, that applies also to the process of turning grain into futures, right, on the, on the commodities exchange. So in New York, um, uh, I think the, the standardization of construction uh, by construction managers, so the George A. Fuller starts in Chicago, but you know, comes to New York, uh, and where our market is so much more excited by the demand, especially in lower Manhattan, uh, to, to, to build tall and to use the value of land, 
that as you become more, structure becomes more industrialized and the construction site becomes better organized and more efficient, that makes it possible for the space to become a commodity for investors the way grain becomes a future and sold on the market, right? So, so when does that happen? Well, if you look at the graph that I showed you based on Don's data, it's pretty clear that it happens after about 1893 into the end of the century. So there are these advances of the industrialization of the process of constructing. There's the huge demand in New York that is constant through immigration, a more populous city, um, and all of the uh, kind of abstraction and commodification of railroad stocks and everything that you could think of that fuels the stock market and the rise, even with the, with the, uh, the ebb and flow or the cycles of demand uh, or of, of the economic cycles that also reflect. It's the accumulation of capital and being able to invest it and compete in creating space in the city that that commercial motive of making the commodity of space to sell in the city to a whole range of, of, of um, individual by the unit, by the room, by the unit renters, that, that is answering this kind of inexorable urbanization that comes. And it, it doesn't, I, I think, I, I, I really can't speak to New York versus um, Chicago, uh, but the, the people who are investing from Boston, like the Shepherd Brooks, uh, are, are just looking for a place for their capital to, you know, to, um, to, to find uh, a place to land, right? And the, and the demand is there. But I, you know, I think that we, we so undervalue demand. And um, I was uh, speaking to my husband over the weekend about this idea, he's an economist. And so um, I, I'd love to make the uh, allusion uh, to, to um, where I learned economics, and it was on Saturday Night Live by, uh, by Father Guido Sarducci. <laughs> Um, who, who had the yeah. one university, if anybody remembers it, or you can look it up on YouTube, the one minute university would give you a class in any, any, any uh, a language or anything, but economics, when he does economics, he says, well, here, here it is, supply and demand. Yeah. Right? This almost explains everything. The demand is constant. Um, in New York as the city begins to grow. The supply fluctuates with, with business cycles as well, but, this, but the supply also grows during the, during the up cycles. So supply and demand in the simplest form of thinking about this to me is the explanation um, of, uh, of a lot. <laughs> yeah. so, uh, Carol just answered your first question. I'm gonna yep. answer the second one and I'm gonna begin by saying that I learned physics by watching Warner Brothers cartoons. <laughs> <laughs> The, the answer to the expertise is that the expertise existed before the buildings did. The expertise was in the structural engineers who were busy building railroad bridges across the country. And they were building very large, very heavily loaded, very complicated steel structures before skyscrapers were built. So the expertise predates the buildings. What you get in the, the first generation, or the first sub-generation, maybe I'd put it, of these buildings is that there's no engineering really. Um, people, it, it, at the time that the Tribune building is built in the mid, mid 1870s, people were getting their steel beam sizes or their wrought iron beam sizes from a table. The table was created by an engineer who worked for Carnegie or one of the other steel companies, but the people using the table aren't engineers. And nobody is designing the brick walls. They, they, are, they are an empirical design that's written in the code and that to some degree is based on you know, decades of, of building construction. Maybe it makes sense, maybe it doesn't. Um, as the, the framing gets more complicated, you start to get these, these horrible sort of deformed hodgepodges. The tower building is New York's prime example of that. I would say the Tacoma building is Chicago's prime example. It's a New York building inside out. The big fat walls are in the middle of the building and the perimeter of the building is cast iron columns. So it's, a, it's a very strange thing. And no structural engineer working in the US in that era would design such a thing. It was designed without proper engineering. And that's the way buildings had always been designed. Structural engineers didn't design buildings. So what you get with the, and this, this is partly comes from architects who were also engineers. Uh, Jenny is the prime example of that. There are, there are others both in Chicago and New York. 
what you get is once people start looking at building entire steel frames, you have to have real engineering and the place to get that expertise is to grab them out of, out of bridge construction. So you get a steady stream of engineers being pulled into, into buildings one way or another, often through the steel firms. Um, I, I began my career at Weisskopf and Pickworth. Samuel Weisskopf began his career working for, for one of the steel companies, I forget which, and he also worked for a bridge company. Then he entered the field of, of building design. Uh, and that's a fairly common career path for structural engineers in the 1890s, 19 aughts. So that's where the expertise comes from. There isn't a shortage of it. There's a lack of understanding at first that you need it. Once people understand what you need, they know where to get it. They go to, they go to bridge construction. And you know the, the classic example on the construction end is that the American Bridge Company becomes, mm -hmm. in part, a building steel erection company. Yeah, and and stays that way through much of the 20th century. Uh, American Bridge did did a lot of uh, a lot of the the post-war uh, towers here as well. That's an interesting way to put it. And I, I wonder, you know, your formulation that the steel frame represents the industrialization of the skyscraper. It also represents the 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 transition to being an engineered structure, right? That building engineering, you're right, isn't something that particularly exists, although, you know, there's a parallel in uh, Great Britain where Fairbairn in particular takes what he learns in bridge construction and applies it to, to mill kind of, you know, what you're just, you're just sort of uh, a, a freewheeling expertise. I've always wondered whether, you know, once the railroads have kind of percolated west, if there isn't this kind of excess engineering capacity, right, that needs to find a, needs to find a market. Um, and and that, that find was a of steadily bigger trains. So the bridges bridges were getting rebuilt at the same location on like a twenty or thirty year schedule. The bridge that wasn't all that old couldn't carry your heaviest trains anymore. So the, yeah. the, the even though the rail network was more or less built out by about eighteen eighty, um, the need for engineering hadn't gone away. Yeah, but it 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 does find a, a healthy market in. Uh, in, yep. in tall building design, for sure, for sure. Um, well, I, I think this is a really fascinating um, topic about different perspectives. I alluded to this at the beginning of my introduction that, you know, Don sees things differently as a structural engineer, an art historian. You describe the difference, I'm going to ask you to, to do that again. And, and Tom, I think because you're an architect, you bring a certain acuity of looking at design issues and construction issues that really so much inform the kind of, you know, the, the, the cultural historian um, in me that, uh, that it isn't really schooled with an eye to those kinds of details and processes. And uh, so, Don, you, you already talked a little bit about that, and that maybe you want to say something a little bit more. I, I, I know that you've talked about um, how art, art history, architectural history, tends to look at the building as an object. Uh, looks at the building as an object. And the other thing is that, um, I mean, art history itself is inherently based on unique objects. Um, you know, you, you, if you're going to look at the work of an artist, uh, you have to look at each thing they've done. You can't say, well, they're all the same. They're not all the same. Um, architectural history for a very long time, not so much anymore, but for a very long time, took its cue from that. And if you look at, Tom, you mentioned before, you know, people trying to figure out where the skyscraper came from at the, at the very end of the 19th century. Uh, if you look at, at architectural history of that era, um, it, it's a history of monuments. It's, it's, a, it's to some degree a list of monuments and their interesting characteristics. Uh, and well, that is the, it's the masonry chart that shows well, the Mason, Victorian uh, era. It, it, it's, I mean, um, Bannister mm -hmm. Fletcher's history, which went through about 500 different editions, uh, mm -hmm. you know, it, it goes through churches in Armenia and then churches in Turkey. And, and it's just one example after another of, of the monuments in a given area. The problem with that for the history of technology is that you can't generalize from it. You can say, 
you know, the, the buildings in Chicago tend to have bigger windows than buildings in New York. I'm not even sure that's true, but you, you can make such a claim and you can try to back it up. But what does that get you? Um, whereas the, the whole point of the history of technology in, in this regard is that things are being replicated. And therefore, there is logic to the replication. There is logic to how a given technology is used and, and uh, how it changes over time. Um, and sort of a corollary to that is that there, is very, there are very few examples of true invention. Um, and my favorite example of this is that not only did Thomas Edison not invent electric light, he didn't even invent the filament light bulb. He came up with the first economic usable filament light bulb, which is not nothing, it's a big deal. But he didn't actually invent the filament light bulb. So all those things about it, Edison invented the light bulb. No, he didn't, um, which is part of the, the whole you know, saying there's no such thing as a first skyscraper. As I said, if you have a 20-year a stretch of 300 buildings, and, and there, there is just a continuous spectrum of structure um, as people are trying different things and as engineers are reacting to what architects want in terms of the facade, which affects where you can put columns and affects where you can put spandrel beams, um, you can't draw a line anywhere. You can't say this is the invention. Uh, and you and I have discussed this at great length, time to let everybody else in on the secret. You know, the, the end of the century debate was kicked off um, by, by Bradford Gilbert claiming that the tower building was the, the first skyscraper and some friends of his put a plaque up on the building that said that. And it was nonsense. And a bunch of people in Chicago felt they had to respond to the nonsense. Here we are 125 years later and we're still doing it. <laughs> For sure. Well, and, and just to, to drive the point home, I think as a, um, you know, what, 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 whatever I call myself, right? I, I've, I've always thought that, uh, you know, on, on one side, the sort of stereotypical art historian who's interested in the monuments and the biographies and the, the individual genius versus the technological historian who sees everything as vernacular, right? Everything is determined by um, what's, what's around. And, and I think that, you know, Don, even though you and I have our, uh, our, our differences, they're subtle. I think both of us see individuals working within this vast network of influences trying to make the best of it and occasionally coming up with a clever formulation that other individuals trying to make the best of it look at and say, oh, that's a good idea. I'm going to put a piece of cast iron in this brick wall and make it make it smaller. Um, and, and that, I think, reflects you know, my own background in practice where you're stumbling around trying to trying to get the best decision and, and less concerned maybe with invention, more concerned with cobbling together out of all the good ideas that, that you see on, uh, around. I mean, design is contingent. Engineering design, architectural design. You, you have a bunch of constraints and you respond to them. Um, and it was not any different in 1880 than it is today in that regard. You, you have to you have to deal with whatever constraints were on you, including price, including um, you know an owner who who fell in love with something he saw in a magazine, right? Uh, so there's there's no way to separate out, as you were just saying, the influences from the final product. Uh, it, it's uh, you're you're working in that system. Um, what you can do is look at the trends over time, and if you if you just put together a, a list of uh, in New York and Chicago, and then nationally later on, um, allowable stresses in steel between 1890 and 1940, they keep going up because our steel is getting better. And more importantly, we're understanding the material better. And if the allowable stress in steel goes up, that means you can do more daring things with it. So as there's a feedback loop, as you use this new technology more, you get more comfortable with it, you learn more about it, you learn what works and what doesn't work, and as a result, you push the technology ahead. It's now a mature technology, it doesn't move very fast anymore, but it still does move. This AISD uh, still comes out with a new steel manual every so often, it changes things a little bit. And it's because people are still in that feedback loop of doing things, new things with steel and finding out that maybe we should reevaluate a bit how we work 
Yeah. I, to, to that point, there's a, there's a good question that's been sitting in the chat that maybe um, is, is worth bringing up, which is, uh, you know, what role did, what role does failure play? Like we're talking about optimizing, we're talking about, you know, looking for, for better ideas and sort of pushing the envelope. Um, in, in particular, the question in the chat is about whether they're building failures with iron. Uh, but I think I think we could generalize that too, right? We're we're not used to our professions moving ahead because of big dramatic failures. They don't happen so much anymore. Uh, but that wasn't the case necessarily in the in the 19th century. Um, uh, go ahead and answer that. And certainly, there were a number of spectacular failures with cast iron um, in the 1890s and the very early years of the 20th century that pretty much killed cast iron. Um, what happened was that these failures showed the, the ultimate effect of things that were already known. Going as far back as William Fairburn in the mid 19th century, people knew that cast iron was brittle and that it wasn't that era. Well, in that column is having tension, it columns are in compression. So why do you care if, if it's gonna fail brittle in tension? That's not a situation that will ever, ever occur except as the walls get lighter and the columns are taking more and more load, some of the columns start to be, start to be not just taking gravity load, but they're taking bending as well. Um, and you've got these, these, I mean, horrible failures, the entire building collapsing in the space of 15 or 20 seconds. Uh, and I'm talking about three of them in New York that come to mind, but there, there were other similar collapses elsewhere. And engineers, who were just getting involved in the building world. Engineers looked at this and said, well, we don't have that kind of collapses in the stuff we build because we build using steel. And as a result, you got for a little while, a sort of bifurcation into buildings without engineers that had cast iron in them and buildings with engineers that didn't. But the cast iron branch died off because it was, it was these failures. And the last one that, uh, of the ones I'm talking about was 1904, were just so horrific. The one in 1904 led to criminal charges and, and uh, a forensic engineering report that said, well, the whole idea of this building was flawed because the frame didn't work. Um, in terms of steel, there were fewer spectacular failures of that kind, but there were failures from fire that led people to reassess how they, how they fireproof the frames. Um, and that one, the failures sort of worked the kinks out of the system very early on, uh, and the, the, uh, the sort of unfortunate proof of this is the Triangle Fire. Um, you had a, a horrific fire that killed over 140 people. The building itself was barely touched. So that was proof that the fireproofing that they had worked out was, was successful. Um, but the non-structural portions of fire protection, egress more than anything else, needed work. So the, the answer to the, the chat question is, um, if you look at the engineering literature of the 1890s, 19-aughts, 19-teens, it is full of failures. Yeah. Well, um, we are at the seven o'clock hour, so I just want to point out that, that Tom Leslie has once again shown his intelligence by being able to both read chat and be on camera <laughs> at the same time. <laughs> and, uh, and this uh, also leads me to the, uh, um, and we will have time to have questions tomorrow, uh, should, watch Tom's talk, and Tom, I'm going to um, ask you um, before we end to, to just briefly do the promo for your, uh, for your talk in order to make sure that people watch it in advance of the discussion. Uh, sure. We will try to incorporate some uh, comments on the Q&A as well, because as uh, so, so speaking of videos um, and, and in the COVID era, my, the exercise video that I uh, that one of ones I listened to in the morning has this exhortation by the um, young instructor saying, "And now we're going to do that again. Yeah, we are." <laughs> and, tomorrow night we're going to do this exactly again yeah we are and so we will be i'm ready for you with uh with unfrozen screens uh and and answers uh to your questions that you may have posed today uh and to also be able in real time to read them tomorrow night uh when tom and don will join uh me again on the on the screen and uh, uh have have questions based on the chicago lecture by Tom Leslie, who will speak briefly about Tom. Yeah, 
So I, I look at a lot of the same things that uh, Don's discussed, but A, from an, from an architect's point of view. So a little bit more, uh, I would say, uh, broad instead of deep, maybe, uh, and having to do with issues of cladding and illumination, uh, like that, which we take for granted today, but motion factor uh, in the in the development of the, of the steel frame, uh, certainly in Chicago. Um, the other thing that uh, I'll look at a little bit, I'm, I'm, I'm going to talk about the transition from iron to steel, which metallurgically doesn't seem like that much, but the, the, the characteristics of steel in particular fabrication meant that it could do a handful of things that made it a, a much more applicable material uh, to, the, to the skyscraper frame than, than iron. And I also want to look at the, the difference between Chicago and New York. And Don and I have this long-standing friendly rivalry, but but I, I think there are some things about Chicago in particular that meant that it did design and build tall buildings just a little bit differently uh, than, than than was done in Manhattan. And so I'll explore that and the the way that uh, the the transition from iron to steel, or really from brick to iron and then iron to steel, uh, played into that. Well, I think um, given all the technological uh, pitfalls and hurdles, um, some of which we overcame tonight, I, I hope that uh, we have succeeded, I know we have succeeded in taking advantage of the far distant relationships in order to bring together some really great meetings, uh, meeting of the minds. So we hope you'll join us again tomorrow night. Um, signing off now and uh, see you tomorrow at six o'clock or at five o'clock if you want to watch Tom's excellent lecture um, right before he speaks. So good evening, everybody. Uh, time for the, the other debate, I guess. Bye-bye. <laughs>